Let's examine the default VPC in more detail. As mentioned before, the default VPC is set up for you by Amazon. If you have an account created after December 4th, 2013, there's a default VPC created for you in every AWS region. First thing before we begin, never delete your default VPC. Frequently, new AWS products start off by assuming that the default VPC exists and try to launch there. Later, as the products mature, they become more adaptable, but it's best not to risk the possible complications of not having the default VPC. If you've accidentally deleted your default VPC, contact Amazon support to recreate it for you. The default VPC typically has an address range of 172.31 to 172.31.255.255, which means that we can have over 65,000 IP addresses. The IP address range is expressed in what's called CIDR notation, that's C-I-D-R. CIDR notation is a compact way of expressing what our IP address is for a whole network and how many IP addresses we can have in that network. This is the US West 2 region located in Oregon along the Columbia River. If you're looking for a region to work with, this is a good one because it is big. Along with US East 1, it tends to have the lowest prices. It is relatively less crowded than US East 1. And in case you care, it is carbon neutral. The default region looks like this. Note the VPC spans all three AZs in the region. Note also that the region has a separate subnet in each of the availability zones. That's because even though a VPC can span an entire region, a subnet can only span a single AZ. So at minimum, if you have three AZs you want to put systems in, you need to have three separate subnets. AWS guarantees that as new AZs are added to each region, your default VPC will expand to include them. Let's focus on the structure of the default VPC. Each of these subnets has a slash 20 designation, which means that each subnet can have up to 4,096 IP addresses, but actually only has 4,091. Why only 4,091? Because Amazon reserves both the first four addresses and the last address in each subnet for its own uses. They're not available for you to use. Beyond the numbering, these subnets are special because any system you put in them automatically has access to the internet. In VPC terms, they're called public subnets because traffic to and from the public internet can flow through them. In order for a VPC to have public subnets, the VPC itself has to have an internet gateway. Then there are two critical parts that make these subnets public. The first is that each of the subnets has an entry in its route table that says if the destination for a particular packet is not in this VPC, in other words, it doesn't have an IP address starting with 172.31, Send the packet out the internet gateway and let the internet deal with it. In technical terms, each subnet has a default route to the internet gateway. The second part is that each subnet will automatically assign a public IP address to each EC2 instance you put into it. Each EC2 instance will then have two addresses, a private IP address for traffic within the VPC and a public IP address for traffic to and from the internet. Think of these the way you refer to things at school or in your community. You tell someone next to you, I'm going to the library, and they know exactly where you're going. But if you wanted to send a postcard to the library, you would have to write down the actual street address for the library. Okay, so we've looked at the theory of the default VPC. Let's put that theory into practice. Here we are at the AWS Management Console. As you can see, we're in the Oregon region, known formally as US West 2. When I click on the VPC, you can see that we already have a VPC set up, and you've probably already guessed that that's the default VPC. You can also see that we have three subnets set up, one for each of the availability zones. How can you tell quickly which kind of account you have? The way to do that is look in EC2 and look at your account attributes. If the supported platform just says VPC and there's a VPC ID under the default VPC, you have an account created after December 4th, 2013, or you have a default VPC that Amazon set up for you. So let's take advantage of where we are and launch a couple of EC2 instances and scatter them around the availability zones to make sure that the instances stay up no matter what happens with the infrastructure. So we'll start off by creating a single instance by launching it. And we'll look for a Amazon machine image that I know definitely has a web server as part of it. So we'll start up this instance right here. We're going to use a T1 micro here because it's free. Here in the instance detail screen, we can check to make sure that we are in the default VPC, and then we choose the availability zone we want to be in. So let's pick 2C here. We can also make sure that we're going to get a public IP address. And as you can see, by default, it's assigned to us when we put it into that subnet. 
so we don't need to add storage. Always make sure that you tag instances. We're on the tag screen here. There's nothing worse than looking at a screen full of systems that you have no idea why they exist, and you don't dare take down because you know someone is depending on them. Call this Web Server 1, and now we'll create a security group to protect our systems. We'll create a new security group that will allow traffic through. We'll call it the Web Server Security Group, and we'll make sure that HTTP traffic can travel across it. So now we've only opened up port 80 for HTTP. We're allowing anyone in the world to talk to it, but traffic going to any other port, FTP, HTTPS, SSH, traffic going to any other port will not be allowed to come into our server. So we'll review this. Yep, it's got the right Amazon machine image, the right type, security groups are set up correctly. So let's go ahead and launch. Amazon requires that you embed what are called public key pairs or public keys in the instance that you're creating. What this does is allow you later on to get into the server if you need to. So I created earlier on a pair of keys, a public and a private key called web server key pair. I have the private side of it, Amazon has the public side, and I'm authorizing Amazon to embed the public key so I can access the system later if I choose to. Remember, however, when I set up the security group, the security group is set up to not allow anyone into the system. You can't access via SSH, for example, on port 22. I can turn that on later if I want to. So let's go ahead and launch the instance, and we'll view the instance and wait till it starts running. Okay, we've got the system up and running now. Note that the status checks are still initializing. So let's go ahead and make a copy of this. So we want to have everything the same, except that we'd like to put this in a different availability zone. So that was our third step here where we configured instance. And the one we chose was in 2C. Let's put this one in 2A. Everything else is still the same, but let's put a different tag on it so we know which one's which. We'll keep the security group the same. It's warning us that we need port 22 open if we want to get into this system. It's okay. We can go back and open up port 22 if we ever need to access this system. And we're again going to use the web server key and we'll launch this instance. So now we have two systems up and going. One is running, one's in the process of going, and we'll wait while the system initializes. And the second system is up. So now we have two systems up, and should anything happen to the infrastructure of one, the other one will still be available. Trouble though is our users would have to keep track of things like the independent IP addresses of each one of those. But Amazon has a way to distribute traffic amongst web servers so the user doesn't have to know who's available and who's healthy. So let's create a load balancer to distribute that traffic. We go in, create a load balancer, what Amazon calls an elastic load balancer, by giving it a name and then telling it that it's going to be running inside the default VPC and what traffic it's going to be load balancing. So in this case, it's going to be sending web traffic. It's going to receive traffic on port 80. It's going to send traffic to the servers behind it on port 80. So let's continue. We can configure the health check using HTTP protocol, which means that in addition to opening the port, we can access a file that would test the entire stack to make sure the database server is running, application servers, anything we need to make sure the web service is healthy. We're going to go a little bit simpler and just open the port. So we're going to change the protocol to TCP. And since we're doing a very simple protocol, reduce the timeout to two seconds, the health check interval to five seconds. Now the thresholds here determine how many times a test either has to come back as healthy or unhealthy before we change the status of the server. So in this case, if two unhealthy checks come back, in other words, two checks fail, we'll mark that server as being unhealthy. We will not send traffic to it, but we will continue to send health checks. And should the number of health checks come back above the healthy threshold, then the system will come back online and we'll continue to send traffic to it. So in this case, We've created an unhealthy threshold of two tests. So if two tests come back as unhealthy, we'll stop sending traffic. And then if two tests come back as healthy, we'll send traffic. In order for a server to first come into the pool, it has to exceed the healthy threshold. There is a minimum of two healthy messages here that have to come back before our systems could be part of our pool. So now we'll create a new security group here. And the security group will be for the elastic load balancers themselves. And what we want to do is have the elastic load balancers accept HTTP traffic from anywhere in the world. And then we'll add the EC2 instances that we created. 
Make sure to tag it so we understand why we created this or who created it. And then review. Everything looks good. Hit the Create button. Now it's going to take a while for the ELB to have sent enough traffic back and forth to the systems before the ELB is sure that the systems are healthy. Let's take this time to make sure that we understand the security arrangements. This ELB is a member of a specific security group. So we're going to go to the security groups for our web servers, and we're going to tell the security group for the web servers, accept any traffic coming in from a member of the ELB security group. So we're going to say HTTP. We'll say custom IP, and you start typing in, and we'll choose the ELB security group. Why do we do this? Well, you could, once you save it, arrange so that traffic coming into the web servers has to come through the ELB itself. So you can create additional layers of security. So we'll go back, look at the instances here. The instances are currently out of service. Refresh the screen, and now they're in service. We just had to wait long enough for the systems to pass the healthy threshold. So this is what we built. We had the default VPC, and then we added a server to one availability zone, a server to another availability zone, and both of those servers worked. But as I said, it's difficult for customers to keep track of our servers by IP address. So we added Elastic Load Balancer and made the connection. The default VPC is there to help you organize and protect the resources you start in Amazon Web Services, without having to do any additional network design. Thanks for watching this O'Reilly training video. If you'd like more information on this topic, click on Learn More. Please don't forget to subscribe to the O'Reilly Video Training YouTube channel for more tutorials. And be sure to like us on Facebook.